accompany the API's languages and service parallelism. The first five or so slides will be a lightning history of the past 15 years of GPUs, or something like that. And then I will talk about the most recent events. The, the, it's like a news round, rounding of the past one and a half years, just to set the context of all the talks that are coming after this. Then uh, I would very quickly would like to talk about the complexity of both the scientific computing and the tools that enable scientific computing and uh, some of the problems that should still be overcome. So, how we got to where we are? Yes, everyone knows, roughly from the 90s, uh, graphics cards came to life and GPUs came <coughs> to one strong, and from the early 2000s, after the GPUs have roughly defined what they are for and what they can be used for, people realized that they wanted to do more with GPUs, that these are actually very good data parallel processors. So they started to violate GPUs in all sorts of exotic manners, doing lattice calculations in pixel shaders using texture units and not. And uh, this research is actually still uh, very popular because it uh, opens the way to new platforms. For example, if one can write that lattice calculation in pixel shaders, then you can also do it in on, on your Android phone, for example. So these efforts are still not there. <coughs> but then NVIDIA heard the rally, uh, answered the summons of the developers, and in 2007, they released CUDA 1.0, which uh, practically read uh, the GPU of everything that the graphics APIs imposed on the programmers, and they, they got a data parallel entry point to programming GPUs. <coughs> and uh, CUDA was followed soon by a myriad of domain specific libraries, and it is still one of the main selling points. CUDA, I mean, there will be a non exhaustive list in another slide. And uh, it is by far one of the biggest efforts in GPGPU, what NVIDIA is doing with CUDA, they put a lot of research and assets into, into designing algorithms that work on GPUs, and then they release it as uh, baked libraries for the end users to use. And the, their driver and compiler toolchain is also rock stable, so external tooling is, uh, can rely on them heavily. And after 2007, on the shoulders of giants, everyone else tried to do the same, what NVIDIA tried to. Uh, just a quick hands up, who has heard of Stream and Brook Plus? One person, yes, two, two, yes. Kind of the ratio I was expecting. So it didn't really gain traction. But uh, Apple introduced OpenCL, which the industry liked so much that uh, they, they wanted in. And Apple was the good guy and handed over the API to Kronos for further handling. Although the trademark is still theirs, but it is handled by Kronos and it's an open standard. Google tried uh, something with uh, called render script, which also didn't gain much traction. It, it's part of the Android SDK, and that is what you should be using if you want to do compute on Android devices. <coughs> and uh, it was first compute only, then some graphics, and then like, no more graphics, back to compute. 2012, Microsoft released C++ AMP, which, uh, which is a really nice API. It is my personal favorite to be <laughs> abandoned. It's discontinued, mostly. It is, uh, uh, Microsoft uh, tried to take a shot at what would C++ look like if GPGPU was there from first day. And uh, its main merit is that one can annotate scopes or function bodies in which a different set of rules apply. So for example, no throwing exceptions and all of the things that are, that are commonly forbidden in GPU code. One could annotate the functions and such, and it was part of the type system. So one could overload on the strictness or this uh, set of rules that a function has. And actually, it's a very nice API. I don't know why it didn't get traction. <coughs> and uh, 
Then Chronos introduced uh, Sickle. I'm not sure of the year. I think it's 2015 or 14, which is the CUDA of OpenCL to be short. So it is a it's a compilation model that builds top OpenCL. There will be a talk about it to uh, talk about it uh, after soon. So I don't want to talk about it too much because it will be introduced. It practically C++ and everything that's good about C++ and you can run it on anything that supports OpenCL message. message. <clears throat> and then there are other APIs, OpenMP, OpenACC, those are pragma driven and they support C, C++, Fortran. Uh, OpenMP is developed by the OpenMP architecture review board. OpenACC is a Portland group uh, compiler or API. <clears throat> they have been acquired by NVIDIA. And if one would think that only the low-level languages like Fortran C, C++ get to benefit from GP, GPU, that's not true. Also, there are all, uh, most popular functional languages, F Sharp, Haskell, No Camel. They all have a GPU uh, version of their compilers, or they have a library that encapsulates it. It's very nice, and one can write the kernels in these languages. And there was also PyGPU, which didn't gain much traction. I uh, think it's not developed anymore, although that would be very nice to do, to write GPU code in Python. But <clears throat> okay, so there are many, many APIs and languages available today that one can make use of, and we will hear a lot of talk <coughs> about use of these APIs. And just a quick tour of the past one year or one and a half year of news. And we think that's new and there is some. <coughs> so AMD uh, created a totally new CPU microarchitecture, which was formerly known as Zen. And the two product lines built on top of it is Ryzen and Epic, with Ryzen being the consumer and enthusiast products and Epic being the workstation and server products. Just so people don't get confused, the consumer products are named Ryzen R357 so that everyone can identify what they want to compete against. And uh, it's a brand new architecture. It's very similar to what Intel has uh, done in, in the past seven or eight generations. It's uh, simple multi-threading. So every physical core is, uh, uh, is seen by the operating system as two logical cores, so they share the same pipeline. And for the enthusiasts, there is, on the consumer uh, side, there is uh, eight cores and 16 threads. And on the enthusiast, there is a chip that has uh, 16 cores and can run 32 threads simultaneously. And on the workstation side, there are even bigger numbers. It tops at uh, 32 cores and 64 threads. There is a new interconnect called Infinity Fabric, which used to be called HyperTransport, if I knew. <coughs> And it is heavily biased towards I.O. capabilities, and the next slide will demonstrate what I mean by that, but the compute power to that as well. <coughs> this is a, the top dual socket uh, uh, rendering of how a dual socket system looks like. It has two sockets, 64 cores and 128 threads. The two, the interconnect that's con uh, con connecting the two circuits to Infinity Fabric, and it has uh, eight channels of DDR4 memory, so it is uh, quite revolutionary in that sense. The DDR bandwidth is enormous. And one of the key things to note here is that, uh, which is not shown on the slide, and I don't know why they didn't make such a slide, is that if it's not a dual socket system, then these are the PCI Express lanes, the PCI 3.0. One in a dual socket, it has 64 and 64 lanes. But if, they, if it's only a single socket now, then the Infinity Fabric is not needed. Then there are 128 PCI lanes to use in a single socket system, which is, which is root. <coughs> And on the GPU side, because AMD can be both, uh, there is the new uh, Radeon Vega architecture, which, uh, which is uh, supposed to rival well, Pascal and Volta. It's sort of in between the two. <coughs> and the first uh, consumer product that is uh, about the Radeon Vega Frontier Edition. It is uh, something like the GTX Titans. So it's the biggest of the consumer cards, but still not the professional 
uh, support that you get software wise. So consider this the Titan of AIM. <clears throat> 4,000 shaders, 13 teraflops single precision, 25 teraflops half precision, because the new buzzword is AI and machine learning and deep neural networks. So all new GPU architectures natively support half precision. 16 gigabytes of high bandwidth uh, cache. And uh, <coughs> the two initial configuration, one is air cooled, one is water cooled. And what they often fail to mention is that the double precision capability is not that stellar. <coughs> Most likely the professional fire pros and the server versions will have these double precision capabilities. <coughs> And because the new buzzword is AI and machine learning, and there will be uh, some talks on this uh, during the two days, there is a new brand, Radeon Instinct, which pretty much means what it's for, MI6 and MIA. MI6 is not Her Majesty's Secret Service, it's just the name of the car. And then the MI25 <coughs> is the new Vega uh, architecture car that is meant for uh, neural networks training. <coughs> And the Boltzmann Initiative is in these efforts to open source all their compiler uh, the infrastructure and drivers. So there are drivers, runtimes, compilers, infrastructures, architectures, libraries, everything is open source. And it's good because well, it shows that they don't have the manpower to do it themselves, to put it shortly. And uh, the pro is that it gains the trust of the open source community and a lot of tooling will be made available in a fairly short time. <coughs> Rockham is the new driver infrastructure that is meant for compute. Unfortunately, the minimum system specs are a little too high. <coughs> and the compiler that, is, uh, that they are developing is a Clank fork, as most compilers today. And it has an a attribute driven API, not Prima, but attribute driven C time support, and it also supports OpenCL to some extent. <coughs> and, uh, on this year's GTC, NVIDIA Volta was introduced. It's uh, the successor of the Pascal product line. And uh, uh, the Volta architecture has absolutely uh, futuristic specs. It is biased towards AI as well, so they're dedicated integer single precision, double precision, and also uh, half precision cores, which are about these tensor cores. So they are quite explicitly meant for uh, neural network training. And you can see the specs there, 7.5 teraflops double precision is, is uh, <coughs> <those there. It's coughs> lots of cache, 16 megabytes of cache. It's unprecedented on the GPU as well. <coughs> and then there's the NVIDIA Drive PX, which is a board designed for semi and fully autonomous car control. And uh, to match these boards, there is a custom designed 1U rack uh, that is packed <coughs> with Volta and it's meant for AI training to be used in autonomous cars or whatever you need. <coughs> and uh, because NVIDIA is famous for releasing a lot of domain specific libraries, they also released NVIDIA DriveWorks, which is a, a set of tools that is commonly associated with the Meaning neural networks and anything that is that has that is related to driving and <coughs> image recognition, and they also tackle the consumer market nonetheless. So there is a, a NVIDIA Grid as their new cloud-based low latency game streaming technology. AMD has something similar. They just forgot to tell the marketing team. <coughs> To the 8.5, although it's not yet released, the documentation already mentions it. It has a fairly complete C14 support, which we would be glad to test as the SDK comes out. And the range of domain specific libraries this is still not exhaustive. The basic linear algebra, FFT, random number, the <coughs> uh, PD or OD solver. And NV Blast, which is a drop-in placement, drop-in replacement of the Unix Flex libraries, video decoding, encoding. This is a uh, NV Graph is uh, for graph analysis, and uh, Thrust is the library that is um, that is the parallelist of 
uh, NVIDIA, so to say. <coughs> and LLVM compiler toolchain is making steady, steady progress to providing an open source alternative to NVCs. <coughs> And from Intel, there is the Intel Night Landing that has been uh, recently released, like one month ago. Uh, Intel also re uh, released much of uh, <coughs> many FPGA works, but because there will be talks on that, I don't want to take other people's talks, but uh, to my knowledge, there will be no talks on Night Landing. This is a 72 core uh, CPU. And actually, it is no longer an accelerator card as FIES used to be. So, <clears throat> and it has a four thread hyper threading, so it's 72 cores and it can run four times as many threads. It can be used as a host socket. You can install a Windows server or a fairly new Ubuntu or, sorry, Linux kernel. <coughs> and uh, the peak. Uh, Clocks are not that high, but it's meant for parallel workloads, not stable workloads. So if you're interested, it's something that uh, that is good to play around with. And their prices have been cut in half just yesterday, when the new AMD processors have been announced yesterday as well, and the, their prices have been cut in half, so you can buy it for cheaper. State of the art. So, a fairly simple GPU compilation uh, model, and why I will be talking about GPU uh, compilers will be apparent in just a few slides. So, you have some source code made with C, C or anything else. You give it to some compiler front end that creates an in memory representation of uh, your source code, and sometime during its life will create an intermediate representation. This is the LLVM compilation model, which is fairly popular. <coughs> This LLVM IR is then fed to the compiler backend, which will create uh, architecture-specific uh, code from it. If you target CPUs, then it is x86, and that's where the compilation model terminates. But if you're targeting GPUs, then, you would, then it will dump some uh, vendor-neutral uh, intermediate, which is speedy DXIL or HCIL, if you know what it is. <coughs> and then these intermediates are fed to a runtime driver, the runtime driver will create something vendor specific from that. And actually, there's another roundabout where this is also fed to the driver again, and it will be dispatched to the hardware, which is truly the device specific instructions. <coughs> so, to put it simply, compiling GPU code looks like this on the software side. Everything that is uh, on the left side is uh, compiler-related technologies, and it will vary depending on which compiler you use. The ones in the middle, those are the API-related intermediate representations, if the API has an intermediate representation. And then everything to the right is vendor-related, and depending on whether you have an open source uh, software stack, then the runtime and driver may not be the vendor's job to implement. <coughs> Only the hardware can create in the Instructions and architecture. And so, as you can see, it's fairly complicated already, and people tend to like increasing uh, complication and complexity anywhere they can. And that is because uh, <coughs> to write good code, people need to, uh, to write good programs, people need to write a lot of code, and people make errors. We are not good at writing, uh, we're not good at writing codes, we make mistakes. So often they insert a tool in between the human and the actual source code that is created. And although this creates complexity, it can help in cases. <coughs> Just a few examples. The C++ uh, WinRT is a project that takes um, a database file that contains all the functions and types that are valid inside the Windows operating system uh, API and the compiler will generate all the header files that is needed to consume the API from ISO C++. <coughs> Vulkan does something very same. There is, a, there is an XML file that contains all the Vulkan API calls and all the types that are valid in the Vulkan host set code. And there is a compiler that generates the header files so one can write actual programs. This is very neat because if a new C++ feature comes out and one <coughs> wants to support it, 
then they just change the compiler and all of the new capabilities will be generated in, into the headers and it's not doesn't have to be manually done. QM example, those are one is Qt and one is a Windows technology, it's a declarative language for uh, defining graphical user interfaces because buttons and scroll bars usually don't move that much, they just put there and they exist. So the declarative form is more natural to use. <coughs> and there are some more exotic uh, compilers like the Qt 3D incorporates a compiler in which one can in a declarative manner say what uh, hardware state changes are required to render a specific scene and uh, it will generate all the OpenGL code that, is, that implements all those state switching and one just has to place in the actual models that they wish to render. <coughs> and uh, how does a typical computational science problem look like? Or, uh, yes, problem looks like, look like today. For example, there is a PD system that one wants to solve and one places an adoptive solver around it, in which in itself can be parallel. <clears throat> then one wants to do some parameter search around uh, the solution, so one places a Monte Carlo wrapper around it, which again in itself is parallel, can be parallel. And then one creates images from the solutions of the PDs and feeds them to a neural network to train and then creates statistics on how well the neural network uh, actually uh, recognized the output of the images. And as you can see, every single step in itself it, uh, can be parallelized. And uh, <coughs> handling the composition of these algorithms is different than just solving a single one of these problems. You can fuse some of the problems or you can run them concurrently. And, uh, <coughs> and what parallelization should one employ when, uh, <coughs> when he wants to uh, tackle such a problem? Where do I insert GPU parallelism or CPU parallelism? Or where do I jump from a single node to a cluster parallelism? And playing around with these uh, takes a lot of time in code because writing uh, non-faulty GPU code, MPI code for each of these levels takes a lot of time. So it would be very good to automate all of these things. <coughs> and the, those decisions are parameter sensitive and, and it's not uh, far from it on how we should tackle such a problem. Yes, we would like to play around with these, not just bake one. So this is the last slide. So why do compilers matter? That, uh, <coughs> Without exploiting the information on every single level that we know and, uh, and generating code that actually makes use of the information, we cannot get the best performance. Just as a simple example, uh, multiplication by an identity matrix on the assembly level, the compiler will never recognize it. You can only remove it on higher level of, uh, of the compilation process. <coughs> There are some just-in-time compilers available, such as the XLA middleware for TensorFlow. So if you write a TensorFlow program, you have a function which will just-in-time compile everything that is underneath, and will try to create optimal GPU code with kernel fusion and everything else available. If one creates too many uh, domain-specific languages, then one can be full subject to the ROX uh, problem, which is if you have a domain-specific language for every single problem, then you have to learn too many domain-specific languages and it won't help you in the long run. And to embed these domain-specific languages into a language that the programmer already knows, Python, C++, or whatever, <coughs> it requires a very good language to embed. And usually you need an expressive language with a strong type system, such as uh, functional languages, multiple languages, or one of the most expressive imperative languages, which currently today is C++ or D, can also be mentioned here. But these uh, embedding, embedding domain-specific languages put stress on the compiler because you're using the language for something that it was not meant to be used for. Usually. So, thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, then I think the coffee break will be more appropriate. Thank you very much, Mante. So uh, we are a bit <laughs> in time, but uh, maybe if you have a uh, question,
we have time for one or two quick questions. Anybody? Okay, so if not, but as Matt has said during the coffee break, we will have uh, time for this. Uh, so let's thank Matt again.